I'm excited about this. We've got a select track tractor here. It's an electric tractor. We don't have much experience with it yet, so it's not gonna be any sort of a full review, just a first look. I'm gonna talk through some of the transmission and just how that works, how the uh, uh, levers work to control the speeds. I'm gonna talk about some of the other functionality that I find unique on this tractor. Again, this is gonna be a multi-step process. We'll have this tractor for a year. I want you guys to learn with me. So let's get started. Well, let's take a look at what we got with this tractor. It was delivered directly from the assembly plant or whatever in Denton, North Carolina. In fact, we got a comment on our first uh, YouTube short from one of the workers there that does the assembly on these. I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, okay, so we have a charging cord here. Uh, that's probably one of the most interesting things. I was a little bit worried about how this charging cord worked. This is a two. 40 volt charging cord. I was worried about the plug. I was like, what, what receptacle do I need? Well, I had no need to worry about the plug because it came with just a stubby wire. More on that in a little bit. We got a uh, slow moving vehicle sign. I'm not exactly sure where to mount that. I didn't see a mounting bracket for that yet, but we'll worry about that someday. Um, Another cord, this is the 120 or 110 volt charging, right? Uh, it's something we'll probably not use except for to test, to see how long it takes to give it a full charge one time. I would suggest anybody getting one of these tractors to use a 240 volt so you can get it charged up more quickly. What else is in here? We got books for both the tractor and the loader, okay? This gives us a little clue here. If we look at this book, it says Farm Track 25G. Farm Track, even though the tractor's named Select Track, it's clearly all together here with Farm Track somehow, and I believe Farm Track comes from India. I've seen these tractors at the Farm Progress show, but I haven't really taken a close look yet. And so I, I believe that's kind of the frame and the, and the basic tractor that they're using is this farm track tractor. In fact, I think this specific select track is marketed as a farm track in Europe, if it's marketed at all yet. I, I really don't know that much about it yet. That's why we're gonna learn together. In fact, let me give you a little bit of uh, uh, my philosophy on that. There's a, a term in, in training called the curse of knowledge. And what they mean is that once you fully understand something, once you, once you grasp it to the fullest, sometimes it's hard to communicate that to others. So I'm going to battle that by having you guys learn with me, right? So as I go, I'll communicate what I'm learning, and I'm hoping that that makes it easier for you to understand and hopefully keeps me from skipping beyond some of the basic things that I've had to, to learn and comprehend with this tractor. I'm just saying right now, there are a lot of differences, and I think that's what's gonna be interesting about this series. Along those lines, it's probably useful for me to kind of share the direction that we'll be going with this series. My motive is to learn about the features and capabilities of this tractor, to learn about limitations of the electrical system, some, some areas where it's gonna excel, some areas where it's not gonna excel. And let me tell you what we're not gonna focus on. There's two things here, you might say two sides of the coin that we're not gonna focus on. The first is we're not gonna brag on how this tractor is gonna save the environment and save our planet from, from certain doom. That's just not what my motivation is for evaluating this tractor. My motivation is to judge it on its merits, how does it work, and hopefully educate you guys along the same way. The second thing is the opposite extreme. You're not gonna hear us talking about how much mining had to be done in some other country to get enough lithium to produce the battery and and how that, you know, it's, it's less efficient overall because it, both sides of these may or may not be true, but I'm not an expert in this. And furthermore, that's just, 
does, you can get that stuff anywhere. You can get people debating back and forth on that anywhere. So what I'm going to do is focus on the tractor itself to the best of my ability. We're going to see how it works uh, from a high level, right? We're going to see all the buttons and gauges, and we're going to see the technical functionality. You know, can it lift? Can it pull? How long can it lift? How long can it pull? That's what we're going to go through. We won't get to all that today because we're preparing for a snowstorm and that's going to be our first usage in another episode after it snows. Let's figure out how it works at this point. Let's talk about getting this thing powered up. There's a lever right here, a little switch, I don't know. It, it, you turn it a quarter turn. Hopefully you can see it in there and not be shadowed too bad. And that turns on the electrical. So that's kind of the the main switch. We, we actually see that a lot in even in some uh, diesel tractors where they can just turn off all the electrical system and, and not worry about discharging the battery. So that's what we've got here, just a, a little switch there. Now I've got a, a key switch right here that I turn on from that point as long as the electrical is on. So I just take the key here and I'll turn it to the on position. And sometimes that wrench stays there and other times it uh, goes away immediately. I'm not exactly sure what's going on there. Now you can hear the whine here. From my experience so far, that's as bad as you'll ever hear the whine. It really doesn't uh, get much louder or, or worse than that. I must talk about four dip switches that are down here. Now you might think those dip switches are in a bad position but quite frankly, we don't need them very often. The first dip switch is the lift button. And when that is off, it doesn't have as much lift force. In fact, apparently it's only enough for the power steering. But I find that I can still lift the bucket. It is slowing down the motor, so the motor goes at a slower RPM we still have some lift functionality, but I believe that's one battery saving concept that they have. Now the next dip switch is the hydraulic pump entirely. So if I turn that off, now no hydraulic pump. So we know what the whine is. That's actually helpful even on that mini excavator we showed a few days ago. We were wondering what the whine was. It's certainly the electric pump. Here it goes back on. Now, if I turn that a hydraulic pump off like that, I have no power steering, right? I have no lift, I have nothing, right? So that needs to be on to do basically anything. I have not checked to see if I have PTO functionality. That's gonna have to wait. Now, what I have found is that sometimes when I have not been on the tractor for a little while and I turn on the switch, it actually doesn't come on. It shows me a little wrench here, and I'm not sure what's going on there yet. I know that I can turn it off and back on and I fiddle with it for a minute and it, and it works. So I've got some things to learn there. I've tried to read through the manual. Yeah, I've read more of the manual than I do on almost any tractor because it's functioning so much differently. In any case, it's not hard to get on. It's just a little bit different than what I'm used to. Hey, I think I figured it out. I hopped up on the seat again and I tried to start it and again, it didn't start. And I think I'm not sitting down on the seat hard enough. That's right, I needed another cheeseburger. No, not really another cheeseburger. I just, if I was pushing backwards on the seat more than pushing down on it, I think that's what the issue was. And it will go off if you hop off the seat. And when I say go off, I mean everything is still powered on, but the motor goes off. And then sometimes I sit down like this, a little bit careful, and I see the wrench flashing here. If I give myself a good push into the seat, it's fine. The seat has an adjustment on it to, to lighten or strengthen the spring. So I think we're fine on that. Now I turned on the hydraulic pump. I think I'm figuring it out. This is making sense. Turn off the hydraulic pump, nothing, nothing works. 
Now, one of the most interesting differences to me is the operating speeds and how you can choose these operating speeds. I don't know whether I should say the gears or whether I should say the transmission. In one case, they say the throttle. It, it gets a little muddy to me in, in, in how to, to say this. So I'll just, I'll go through it the best I can. And, and, and maybe you'll understand. If not, leave some, leave some questions in the comment section. That'd be great. First of all, there's a lot of similarities to a hydrostatic transmission. Um, it's, it's electrically driven, but there's a lot of similarities in how it feels. But it's not exactly the same. Um, there's a low and a medium and a high right over here that you need to be stopped to shift. That's just like a hydrostatic transmission, three range, that, that makes perfect sense. I did well with that and then I got confused up here because right up here there is a, they call it fast, normal, and slow, FNS. And it's listed as range here when, when we say that. It can be shifted on the go. Now when I'm reading in the manual, it talks about that being the max RPM that the motor's willing to run, right? So you set that at a lower RPM, you, so, so you put that into the turtle here, then your pedal, the full range of the pedal will go from zero to, I believe it's 2000 RPM. If you set it to the normal, it's zero to 2500, and if you set it to fast, it's zero to 2800. I believe those numbers are what I read in the manual, not perfectly confident in that, don't hold me to it. The numbers don't mean anything to me anyway, right? I mean, 2,000, 2,500, 2,800, they don't really mean much to me. So maybe that's why I might be a little nervous about whether they're accurate. In any case, this can be shifted on the go, okay? From, from my experience so far, you can shift this on the go. Now, forward and reverse is shifted right here. So there's a difference from a hydrostatic transmission. This is neutral, this is forward, this is reverse. If you have your foot on the pedal at all, the, the shift here doesn't take effect. So the pedal becomes like an accelerator pedal on a car, more so than a hydrostat pedal, right? Because uh, with some of our other equipment, we have either the treadle pedal on a Kubota or two separate pedals on the deer. So you have an indication of forward and reverse within the pedal. You don't have that here. They have a hand throttle here, but it really is just uh, an alternative to the foot pedal. I would kind of consider it a cruise control of sorts. Um, if you put the machine in gear, you have it running, you pull the, they call it the throttle down, it will start to move. If you have the throttle in the low position, it will not move by itself at all. As soon as you pull the throttle down, the machine begins to move, okay? And if you pull it down further, it moves faster and you have to shove that back to stop the movement. Contrast that with the pedal, which when you let off the pedal, it, it's spring-loaded. It will come back up just like an accelerator pedal on a car. That's really the only difference I can see in the way they operate. The net result here is that we have nine speeds, right? We've got three speeds here, low, medium, and high, and then we have the three ranges within each main gear. This allows a really slow speed. There's a chart here I'll show you but there's a really slow speed. Notice this chart is in kilometers per hour, so you'll have to do some translation. Multiply those by 0.621, and you will get miles per hour. Looking through the chart, I see that the fastest is 17 kilometers per hour, or about 10 and a half miles per hour. That's the maximum speed. It is already divided up per tire type, so I don't think we're going to have to worry about it being inaccurate depending on which tire you have, the ag tires. They seem to be a lot different size, the ags and the industrials. I haven't seen the turfs. So that's already compensated for in the chart that you see here. What I don't know yet, and we'll have to wait for another episode, is whether this range has any impact on how much torque you get to the ground. So in other words, if we put it in a slower range, are we going to see more torque? I'm thinking we may not. I'm thinking with an electric motor, we may see full torque. No matter, we'll see how it goes. I, I think that's a, a reason to stay tuned to our next episode. What in the world, cat? I think that's enough basic information on how the propulsion is controlled. Uh, I hope you notice I'm kind of choosing my words there. I hate to say on, that that's how the transmission works. 
it's not how the transmission works and I don't have a clue right now how the transmission works. I know that it is some sort of an electric motor and I, I, I really don't know from there. So I, I am just gonna say that we're trying to discuss how it is controlled, how it's managed, rather than how it actually works. What do you think, Bo? I think we should call him Sparky. What do you think? The worst thing about these big 240 volt plugs to me is just how big they are, right? Especially when it comes to the wire entering it's, it's always quite a large, it's expecting a huge wire, and yet the wires that I end up having are pretty small. So that's, that's what's going on here. I do believe this one's gonna be able to squeeze small enough to get this wire in and get it squeezed down. But they're, they're all made that way. They're all made to be able to handle all size wires. Okay, Bo. Now we'll run it through there and not worry about that for a moment. Okay, I'm gonna strip these a little bit. You know, electrician or not, this, this stuff is, is really easy to handle. And if, if you're not used to doing this kind of work or if you're scared of it, well, again, just practice a little bit, study it, make sure you're doing the right thing and you will be fine. For instance, this plug here, it tells us it says black, green, and white. Well, we have black, green, and red. Well, go with the black and the green like they say, and not with the white. Not that much difference here. So the green is always the ground. Now, I will say that this seems like a pretty small wire to be running as much current as I think we're going to run, but I'm sure for only 10 feet it's fine. It's just seems pretty small. What are you, what are you doing, Bozai? I can tell you that little wire like this is a lot easier to work with than the bigger wire, that's for sure. Now, optimally, we'll tighten this up and squeeze it enough that even a good tug on the plug will only pull on this connection right here and it will not be tugging up in there. That's the idea. And now you can see why it's important not to tug the plug, as they taught you, or at least they taught me in elementary school. Do they still teach that kind of stuff? Okay, we have uh, like 87% charge on this machine right now. And you're not supposed to charge it until it's below 20%. So naturally, before the very first time I try to charge it, I'm going to disobey the rules, right? Well, uh, we're gonna be working in this snow. It's already snowing now, but we're gonna be working in this snow tomorrow. And I wanna make sure that we have a full charge feel like that'll be the best way to, to gauge its effectiveness. It's supposed to be zero to 10 degrees Fahrenheit tomorrow. The tractor says not to operate it below 15 degrees Fahrenheit. But hey, you know, you buy your tractor to remove snow, right? So, uh, you know, I'm gonna give it, give it the best start I can simply by keeping it here in a relatively warm shop. So it, it'll be 50 to 55 degrees in here overnight. And then uh, when we go to get it out, it'll just have to deal with the cold and we'll see how it handles it. I get it that, you know, that's outside the, the stated operating range, but I, I don't think there's much I can do about that, right? I mean, that's, that's the whole point of having a tractor is using it when you need it. Um, so only, my only issue is I, I hate that that's my first real usage of it, but hey, we deal with what we got. We got the tractor here in December, so that's, that's what we're gonna use it for. So let's get it set up to charge and see how much current it draws while it's charging. Remember, I just installed the electrical measuring, the energy monitor in the last episode. If you wanna see how that works, you can go back to then, but uh, I'll be able to see how much current this particular circuit draws and see what, it, see what it takes to charge. And then hopefully we'll time it. It shouldn't take a horrible amount of time because again, it's 87% charged right now. The cord they included was 10 foot long. And I think that is gonna be just perfect for us. Where it's sitting now anyway. It's not that big of a deal, I guess. You can get extension cords or you can actually make them with the same plugs I just showed you. That's what my dad did. He just got some larger wire and 
put a plug on one end and a receptacle on the other, and we've used that extension cord for years. It's probably 50 feet long, and uh, that, that has worked very well. And it's you know much less expensive than trying to buy one that's already put together. Yeah, the receptacle end may be a little bit more cumbersome because it's a, it's a square box receptacle. Okay, anyway, let's plug this in. I think this is a regular car charging port. Okay, I heard something. I don't see anything on the unit. I hear a fan running. The book said there would be a fan running. Okay, let me see if I can get some immediate power usage. 3.375 kilowatts. Gigawatts, as Dr. Brown would say. No, it's not gigawatts. 3.38 kilowatts. Now, of all the usage I'm using in the shed right now, that is 67% of the, of the usage we're using overall. Well, we'll see how long that lasts. Presumably, it will go off when it's all done. Now, I'm going to cheat just a little bit. I need to raise the loader for the next part of the project, so I guess it'll be off by just a little bit. But I'm going to hop on, raise up the loader, and we'll go to work on the front end. I guess it's another interesting point to know. Will it, will it start and run while the charger is plugged in? And the answer may be no. It will not run while the charger is plugged in. So everybody that was joking that I needed to um, just have a really long extension cord to keep it running, I guess that won't work. Here we go, we'll plug her back in again. Yep, fan came back on, we're charging again. Okay, we'll use the magic of video to let it charge, and then we'll come back and tell you how much it costs to charge it from 87% to full. Stay with us. Okay, we're back now. The charge is complete, the fan's gone off. I can see that there's no more current being drawn. So let's review the time that we dealt with here. We were about one hour and 40 minutes total for that charge, but let's break it down a little bit. You can see that we started here at about 5.30 p.m. Notice the little glitch where we stopped and restarted. That's where I unplugged it to, to raise the loader. At about 6.16, it dropped from the full 3.38 kilowatts to roughly half, 1.76 kilowatts. And then it went 31, 32 minutes, and it cut in half again. And then another... 22 minutes and it shut down. This is only my first charge, so uh, and, and then we only had 13% to charge. It was at 87% when we started. So I don't think it's fair to extrapolate to say, hey, if it takes an hour and 40 minutes to do 13%, that it'll take yeah, however much to, to do the whole thing. Because what I'm seeing here is that it, it dropped down over time. Right, so once it got to a certain level of charge, it lowered how much it was charging, probably to keep from destroying the battery. Uh, that makes perfect sense to me, and I suspect that part of the charging cycle is probably consistent every time. So you're probably always going to have roughly an hour to finish the charge. So probably 45 minutes, 40, 45 minutes, plus the hour to complete is what we dealt with here. I need to look up for sure, but I think I'm somewhere in the 13 to 14 cents per kilowatt hour. And we use 3.87 kilowatt hours total. 3.87 times 0.135, if it's 13 and a half cents, it'd be 52 cents for that charge. That's actually not too bad. We're not getting quite as much snow as I had hoped, but we'll see how that turns out. Hopefully in our next episode, we'll be able to show it outside working snow. Until then, I, I hope you found this helpful as a first episode. Not all the information is going to come out at once. It's going to take me a long time to learn it, and I want to share it with you as we learn. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time on Tractor Time with Tim. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly army of angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among people with whom he is pleased.
Easy now. There you go. Oh, you promptly knocked it off. <laughs>